The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and a very, very warm welcome to this webinar and on renewable energy and very sorry for the slight delay in getting started today. I'm Ashley Moore, Corporate Communications Manager at SIPFA and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Uh, this is the third in a series of webinars that SIPFA has partnered on with ADEPT over the last year, as well as part of a wider series of webinars that SIPFA is hosting to examine a range of issues affecting public finance professionals. This morning's webinar will focus on how place directors, finance directors and their teams can work together to build the business case for local authority investment in renewable energy generation and storage. Now, before I introduce our speakers, I do want to remind everyone that we want this to be an interactive event and that this is an opportunity for you to put your questions and comments forward to our panel for them to respond to and discuss. As is the usual format for these events, you're able to submit a question via the chat box, the chat box on the GoToWebinar dashboard that you should have on your screen. Once the presentations have concluded, I will put those forward to our speakers. You can submit a question at any time and there's no need to wait until the end of the presentations. Just for general awareness, I'm conscious of the fact that on the SIPFA website, there was something on there that mentioned this webinar would be going on until 12.15. So apologies for that slight administrative error. To confirm, this session is one hour long and will be ending at 12 p.m. So, to discuss this topic today, I am absolutely delighted to introduce our first speaker, Cheryl French. Cheryl is the Assistant Director for Climate Change and Energy Services at Cambridgeshire County Council. She is the organisation's lead on climate change and is responsible for the planning and delivery of programmes and projects to deliver net zero carbon emissions and climate adaptation for both the council and the wider Cambridgeshire area. So without any further ado, I am going to hand over to Cheryl. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. So my role here is to just give you a quick scene setter before you get three exciting um, case studies um, uh, following. One thing I just wanted to put to uh, this group is um, just, sorry, I can't get my screen to move, um, um, Ashley. Yeah, Not I've to tried. worry. One second, Cheryl. Let me just double check that that is working. I'm just going to unshare and reshare with you and hopefully that will solve it. There we go. Oops. OK, thank you. Sorry. Um, what I just wanted to put um, across to you um, on the seminar today is that um, local authorities back in 2010 were effectively given um, the power or the uh, um, uh, benefit of being able to sell electricity. So the sale of electricity by local authorities, uh, regulations 2010, um, allowed local authorities to sell electricity and to benefit from that process. We're also, under the Local Government Act of 1976, local authorities are allowed to generate, distribute and sell heat to our communities. Those two powers or um, um, opportunities have been really welcomed as we look to government's uh, regulatory position and legislative position of delivering net zero by 2050. So government has put in place um, a target to net zero by 2050 and is coming forward gradually with a series of um, policy frameworks and uh, regulatory opportunities for us to use, um, for us to um, deliver through some of our powers in local authorities to bring forward the significant levels of change uh, that uh, require renewable energy and decarbonisation of heat and transport. So some of you might be familiar with the industrial strategy, which is has got a number of significant challenges identified in it, but clean growth and how the country benefits from clean growth is one particular strand of that strategy. We also have a clean growth strategy, which is identifying how and what and to what scale are we needing to deliver renewable energy. Um, and um, what it is we need to um, uh, undertake as local authorities to help facilitate that. We also have the sixth carbon budget, which some of you might have seen, which came through from the Independent Commission on Climate Change, which basically says that we need by 2035 to have uh, delivered 78% reduction of uh, carbon emissions from the 1990 baseline. 
And just to give you a sense of what that means, uh, along with the uh, white paper, which is powering our net zero future, it, it means that all UK electricity is to be clean by 2035, and that all transport, heating and industrial um, mechanisms to have clean electricity to support and power them. What this means is that the market is going to significantly grow and uh, change over the next 10 to 15 years as we have a, a significant upscale in demand, a further 50% in demand for clean electricity is going to come forward. So having that big policy framework and having the regulatory abilities to generate and to um, distribute uh, both electricity and heat, local authorities have been looking at what is it we can do and how do we do it and what are the skills that are required to make this difference. So this slide is just a quick um, uh, indicator of just the final use expected by 2050 for you to get an understanding of the scale of change between what is effectively a, an economy reliant on coal, fossil fuels and um, so gas and moving to electricity, renewables and hydrogen. Our role in this transition is key, and I think there is a lot of conversation now happening with government around what are the additional powers that uh, uh, local government would benefit from having under their remit to support the transition. But importantly, we already have enough to get projects moving, and some of the forward-looking authorities are just going to be describing what that looks like. But really, we have placemaking roles. How do we create a low carbon future, a low carbon place in town centres, in rural areas? What are the powers like planning powers? What are the economic incentives that we can use? What are the um, skills and um, uh, grant regimes that we can align to help deliver against this? So we need to think about how we're going to create places how we shape the market, how do we build up our supply chains locally to deliver, and how do we become a repository using public sector assets to start putting down key schemes that we can build a new smart energy future on. And, and certainly after coming out of the pandemic, we're also needing to think, well, how do we bring forward that green recovery that uh, reflects the climate emergencies that many of our organizations have um, um, declared. So the final slide I wanted to just show you was just actually um, an anecdote of my experience with Cambridge County Council, uh, which started six years ago, and how when you can collaborate closely and have the skill sets in the finance team to bring projects forward, it makes such a difference. When I started at Cambridge County Council... Cheryl, um, apologies, apologies for cutting in here, but I think we might be having some difficulties with your slides moving on. Some of our delegates are saying that we they're, they're only seeing your opening slide. Um, oh. In the interest, of, I'll, I'll, I'm happy, I'll move those along for you just in the interest could you, of time could you not, to the not next interrupting slide. your flow. Yes, please do, quickly. That was, the, that was the slide, which was the illustration. This is the role of local authorities. Sorry, everybody. And then this last slide is the one I want to quickly major on. So six years ago, I was talking to finance people to say, how am I going to get a finance, how am I going to get a renewable energy scheme uh, developed? Um, how do we do the financing? And what I got back from the, the, the finance teams was, well, you tell us and we'll say yes or no. And I really struggled. Uh, you know, net present value, IRR, you know, what were the uh, insurance details we were having to look at? Uh, what was the market modeling that we needed to do? And then I was offered an accountant who was experienced in financial modeling. That transformed how at Cambridge County Council we could put together new projects, um, how the language that the uh, finance uh, team could provide in discussions with members, how that transformed the relationship between um, us having energy skills, understanding how to develop 
energy projects, but needing that commercial and financial acumen that came through from the finance team and their relationships with members around how to manage risk that really started changing the discussion and narrative and process and success that we've been able to bring forward at Cambridge Accounts Council. So I think as I move forward, my concern is, are the finance teams getting enough understanding around carbon pricing, around the energy markets? Are they upskilling on this agenda? Because more and more we're going to see these projects coming forward. So one of the key aspects that we really need to focus on, and uh, certainly finance professionals need, our, need to, to work with us, is just around the risk management of these schemes coming forward and what those look like in terms of the appetite for local authorities as we all move through this climate emergency and our response. So that's where I just wanted to finish my setting the scene, and um, I think we're going to move into the first case study. We are indeed. Thank you very much, Cheryl. And apologies for the difficulties with the slides there, ladies and gentlemen. Just to reassure you, the slides and the video will be available after the session. So if we do end up having to rush through anything, you will be able to go back and look through any slides that were missed. So it's my pleasure to now hand over to our second, speak our second speaker, Dr. Dara Casey, uh, Energy Services Manager for West Sussex County Council. Dr. Casey is responsible for the council's deployment and management of renewable energy assets. Prior to this, he held roles within the authority encompassing business development and energy management where he was responsible for the development of financial models and business cases to deliver energy improvements in the county council's corporate buildings as well as managing the performance of energy assets so please do keep handing in your questions and i'm going to endeavor to hand over to dr casey dara please do let me know if for one reason or another this um, I'll, I'll cut in if the slides aren't working but um, and i can i can move through them for you Great, thank you, Ashley. Good, good morning, everybody. Uh, Dara Casey here from West Sussex County Council. Uh, I'm going to keep talking and presume you can all hear me and see the slides. Um, today, I'm just going to talk to you about four key areas, really, um, in terms of getting started. I should just say I, I agree 100% with what Cheryl has has already described in terms of getting going and and you know the the steer from central government being around. Uh, actually supporting local authorities to to take action in this area but i think it's really important first of all <clears throat> you know if we're if we're you know to presume we we've got a standing start to first of all try to understand our own organization and our capacity for change and our capacity to to move then we can also uh, we'll also look at understanding the opportunity uh, before individual uh, local authorities or public sector bodies uh, i'll then talk mention a little bit about developing that concept once you've got an understanding of what you want you know what you can and what to do and then i'm going to very briefly discuss battery storage and you'll notice that i've 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 caveated that as a health warning uh, and we'll go into a little bit uh, about why that is later on so starting off but with understanding your organization um i think there's in terms of getting going there's quite a lot that that um be it colleagues in our estates team or asset management team can do to just get us get us started and trying to understand what is the type of opportunity that for renewable energy projects that that you know we can all um, start to to understand and most local authorities will have an asset register of some sort uh, there may be gaps in it there may be um, issues around some data quality or whatever but actually I think in terms of getting started it's very very useful to try and understand exactly what you're looking at um, the, uh, the the process through which asset through which assets are managed is the process through which opportunities will be identified. So uh, at West Sussex County Council, we have a, a process whereby we declare assets uh, surplus to our, our requirements and engaging with the, uh, with the estates team to identify where in that process is best to, uh, to, to actually interface and to work with them to understand whether or not an asset that is, for example, no longer needed for its original purpose, um, whether that can be transformed into an energy project. That's the kind of thing that would be uh, a great place to start. So my first, uh, my first starting point was really about examining the asset register that might be something that uh, can be done exclusively in-house equally a number of um, uh, 
organizations that that we're in dialogue with they will bring in an external party to to have essentially an audit of their assets to try and understand what's the scale of the opportunity and also what's the type of the opportunity um, it's also very useful to understand what buildings you have that have uh, either are occupied by your organization itself or where you have third party occupiers and for West Sussex County Council we would include our schools portfolio in that so uh, within West Sussex schools have their own utilities budget their own governance structures so they're they're you know quite an arm's length organization so we need to work with them as third parties uh, essentially and, and offer a service to them if we want to work with them on on deploying renewables um, it's also very very useful uh, as early as possible in the process to understand what the what the position for any assets that you've identified what the position is with respect to way leaves easements or tenancies on that site and whether there are any sites where the tenancies are either short hold or they're you know they're coming up to a conclusion within the next couple of years getting early sight of that is absolutely so valuable and then there's also one element which is about just the geographic um, proximity to electrical infrastructure now that doesn't necessarily need to be a primary substation or something of that nature um, renewable energy projects when developed at scale and scale is the key the key point here they can be uh, connected in at a, at a you know reasonably close pylon rather than a, a, an electrical substation so there is some work there around understanding the opportunity what that might show you is that you have relatively little opportunity about you know developing out big solar farms and things like that but actually quite a lot of opportunity with respect to rooftop solar solar panel projects um, and then you would start to try to understand whether you've got um, you know more you know much of an opportunity there to actually act upon also it's really important just to revisit where your organization is with respect to its energy strategy if it has one if it doesn't already have one it might have a climate change strategy which mandates action on this a lot of local authorities have um, gone down the route of um, of climate change um, um, emergencies noting noting climate emergencies so that's again something that's it's very important to do so uh, and also understanding where you are in terms of your electricity prices and your contracts things like that and looking at where is inflation going and the next one is an example of where a piece of work we did in 2017-18 where we were looking we were working with our third party intermediary laser energy buying group looking at where prices were going and this graph really helped us to try and understand what was the range of electricity price uh, increases that we were going to see over time so it's really again on understanding your organization it's very very important as cheryl said earlier on about understanding what in-house capability and capacity you have uh you know there's lots of different teams that will have a level of involvement um some of it really quite critical in terms of the success of any project or plan that you want to put forward so it's very important to engage early with those teams possibly at the business uh, business plan development stage so that they can book in time and if there are some requirements to upskill as well that it's it's actually a really good idea to start there uh, at West Sussex County Council, we apply the Intelligent Client Capability Framework, which is by the Institute of Civil Engineers, which basically means that for our projects, um, we are essentially the intelligent client. We have project managers in-house um, that are supporting the delivery, but really we procure a lot of the specialism uh, in from the, from the private sector to support our ambition in this uh, space. So a final slide, I think about understanding your, your opportunity um or sorry uh first slide about opportunity i think it's really important to first of all recognize whether you think you have a project or a program of work um and it's absolutely fine whichever you have but i think where you have a program of work um you will approach that in quite a different way to whether you have one or two or three projects and you've got to consider the scale of each individual opportunities uh, opportunity if we're talking about a you know a handful of solar panels on a handful of buildings um you know that doesn't necessarily warrant a program uh a, approach towards this but if you're looking at you know your assets and you've identified that there's significant scope for both solar farms connected directly to the grid as well as um solar and maybe also battery storage projects on your buildings then it might well be that actually you're looking at developing a program rather than a, a, a small number of projects. It's also very useful to understand the replicability 
so if you know if if you're uh, looking at delivering a number of one-off projects as opposed to being able to develop a project develop some learning bring it in-house or bring significant portions of the of the management in-house and then deploy in a cookie cutter fashion uh, a number of of these opportunities um, then again it's it's about helping you to kind of make a judgment around whether or not a project approach or a program approach is best. Um, it's also useful to consider the complexity of the project. So with a number of uh, solar panel projects, it is pretty much fit and, for fit and forget. And your colleagues in facilities management may be open to taking on the operation and maintenance um, of those solar panels. Uh, however, um, it may well be that the, the, the projects themselves are actually quite complex. And I would put battery storage into this category for sure. Uh, uh, and they they require a lot more involvement from from you or your teams uh, to deliver them on on a longer term basis. And finally, you know, it's very important to consider risk. Market risk is very significant. Uh, policy risk, where um, you know, the in terms of the ever changing nature of the energy markets and how you know certain technologies are supported more than others, that sort of thing is very important. And then finally, of course, technology risk. At West Sussex, we've taken the view that this is a program, that we want to develop a program of work, and we've identified, we've brought together a strategic outline case for the program. So we've got project archetypes in there around developing out grid connected solar, as opposed to developing out rooftop solar, and we're developing battery storage to sit alongside that. So our strategic outline case is, is developed uh, up front of the individual um, outline business cases and full business cases. But then it's also important to consider whether you will you your intention is to build an energy services or a climate change function uh, out of something that you've already got um, is that the direction of travel for your organization and then I think it's also extremely important to you know have an honest conversation with colleagues in estates finance legal and procurement uh, without you know their support and and uh, capacity um, you know the, the program isn't really going anywhere so it's also important to note at West Sussex, we've identified that solar solar panels, uh, solar PV and battery storage are the technologies that we're really interested in deploying. Uh, they work for West Sussex. We are starting to develop um, heat pump technology and some experience in-house as well. But it's also about recognizing that the the investments that you make in in your uh, project will have to be monetized there will there will be, have to be a clear way in which you intend to realize the value of your investment and i think alistair later on will be talking a little bit about power purchase agreements and and how you can use those so that's really important to do but it is very important that you're quite clear almost from the outset about how you want to do that and what risks um come along when when you do that in terms of developing the concept, um, I think, you know, from West Sussex's point of view, I mentioned about having a strategic outline case um, up front and, and then, you know, the individual outline business cases for projects fall into that. Um, but if, you're, if you don't have that, then, you know, we start with a concept note around a site that our estates colleagues have given us an opportunity to look into. That's developed internally, looking specifically about what's the opportunity between who's on site, who's adjacent to it, is there an opportunity to feed power in, into the grid or into a, um, a building that has some use. We then move to, uh, sometimes we have pre-feasibility for our bigger projects. Uh, we start to bring in some external support. We start to spend some money on developing um, our understanding and looking at the long list of options. And that helps to bring forward the outline business case. We then will spend quite a bit more money on uh, feasibility studies, energy market uh, advisory reports. And we'll also go to planning for a number of, for, um, for our, our preferred option to try and understand exactly what the sort of planning conditions will will uh, be will need to be met in terms of delivering that um, in terms of developing the concept there's a huge range of financial considerations to be brought into into play here uh, i wouldn't let this long list put you off however most of these uh, are relatively modest sums um, you know we've got the the big funds around capex and things like that and it's just important to note that there are uh, a number of these areas that need to be considered at least 
And then finally, battery storage. Um, we've got a four megawatt battery storage um, facility at West Hampton at Solar Farm, and it is a terrific addition to, to the, our solar PV portfolio. We've got a couple of solar farms already, um, and it does add uh, quite a lot of value to our um, to our um, assets. There's a variety of use cases. It can be used in a number of different ways, but you need to know how you're going to use it. I think in terms of selling services, that's actually quite a complex area and it does move as well. So it's really important that you have specialist support. Um, we use um, NPower Business Services to, to do that and we're very happy with, with what their help that they give us. Uh, there is higher financial risk than solar, so you do need to be aware of that and reflect it in any decision reports you put forward. And very finally, before I pass back to Ashley, uh, I think it's also really important that you re recognize the significant requirement for the client, as in ourselves, to upskill and support informed decision making by your aggregator in terms of how you sell services. So quite a whistle stop tour, but I'm still over by two minutes. I'm a, I apologize. I'll pass back to Ashley uh, for the next speaker. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Casey. Some really interesting food for thought there. Um, next up, we have Alistair Mumford, Corporate Energy Manager for Devon County Council and Regional Programme Manager for the Southwest Energy Partnership between Bristol, Plymouth and Devon. Alistair is a highly experienced project manager and consultant in the low carbon sector and is responsible for the development and delivery of a range of low carbon projects in the building retrofit, electric vehicle infrastructure and renewable areas. So uh, without any further ado, I will hand over to Alistair. Great, thank you. Have I got control of the slides now? You should do. Let me just uh, take Hello. control Hello. back and um, there we go. It's working. reassign it again. Sorry, that was me. One second, let oh. me just reassign control. There we go. Okay, you should now have control of the keyboard and mouse. Let's try it. Hang on. Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so thanks very much for the opportunity to talk about some of the work we've been doing uh, around supporting the community energy sector with this. Uh, we're trying to deliver locally generated green power. Um, so just in terms of uh, scene setting, I suppose, um, like all public sector, I'm hoping all public sector organisations, Devon County Council has declared a, a climate emergency um, and we have a policy target uh, of um, achieving net zero carbon emissions uh, um, by 2030 and securing uh, a minimum of 30% uh, of our total energy from renewables by 2030 as well. So those are our, our policy drivers and you know we have looked into putting PV uh, solar panels on, on our own fields, uh, we're, we've got a farms estate, and also um, uh, looking to sort of enter into corporate PPAs. But in general, neither of those worked, although I suppose we need to look into the, the land one, but it's essentially we just didn't have land of a good enough size really to, to, to interest um, or to make it viable from a business case point of view. Um, and also with, with, with uh, entering into corporate PPAs, you know, we get our energy from laser, uh, which is a framework, and our procurement colleagues were very happy with that. They didn't really want to start playing around with that. Um, so um, what we've started to think about is, well, how can we, how can we stimulate further? But Devon County Council is also a very keen supporter of community energy. Um, and we've got a, a number of um, uh, community energy groups in, in the in the county. And they've also come together to form a collective called the Devon Energy Collective, which is specifically working on their behalf on larger, um, uh, large scale uh, renewable projects. So, you know, we wanted to try and support that. We can see the benefit of community energy, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Um, and we also want local energy. You know, if we enter into a, a, a PPA, a power purchase agreement, an arrangement uh, with a, a renewable supplier, we really want that energy to be in uh, the locality. That's for economic reasons, but also just from efficiency reasons as well. There's no point we need distributed energy across the county. And Devon is very, very lucky that we have high levels of irradiance uh, as well. And I'm pretty good for onshore wind, but that obviously is very difficult at the moment. Um, so the problem there was that procurement regulations got in the way. We can't go out and say, okay, we're interested in entering into a PPA with a community energy group and a community energy group that's based in Devon. Um, and so that, that just wouldn't meet procurement regulations. 
there seems to be actually you just had something through last week from one of our procurement lawyers that that might be slightly softening now it could be possible that you can uh, you can determine uh sorry not determine define where a, a supplier is located um and also whether they're a, an sme or a voluntary community and social enterprise so there's possibilities there that you might get the uh, restrictions that you need but uh, by no means certain um so i'll go to the next slide hopefully yeah um so this is sort of just a diagram to show our sort of current relationship although our electricity now comes from eon because eon have bought an empower but you know we've got some pb on our roofs um not much at all you know at the moment we're about one percent of our total energy consumption comes from renewables and i think that's rounded up so it's probably at 0.6 percent um but so we got some some pb on roofs and we get some energy from that it's also exporting into the into the licensed supplier market as well and obviously we've got our tariffs with with um with mpower so that we've we've got those um you know we're getting energy from them and, and we're paying them we are getting some of the renewable certificates the the regos the renewable energy guarantees of our origination for the the pb that we've got so that helps us to be able to claim that um um uh, the, the the renewable benefits there what we want to try and move to is a situation um, which is going to be a little bit different. So we want to try and use something that's called a, a synthetic power purchase agreement. So this is where we enter into a, um, uh, an agreement with a renewable energy developer. Obviously for us, it would be a local community energy organization, the Devon Energy Collective. And we guarantee the price that they're going to get for the electricity generated over seven years. So with that guarantee, the developer can then go out and secure finance and build a generation site, which is obviously critical at the moment because they haven't got the subsidies to rely on. So that, that guarantee is, is essential, really. So as the site wouldn't have been built without Devon County Council providing that guarantee price, I argue that we can take the carbon savings from that. Uh, and in that way, we can we can use this agreement to deliver the carbon offsetting um, that we know is going to be needed. So when I said that we're going to be net zero, that's going to be through at least 70 percent reduction in carbon emissions and then no more than 30 percent offsetting. So there's, there's stuff that needs to be happening. So in this diagram, you've got your generator, the sunshine. So they would be um, selling electricity to the wholesale market. Um, and, and getting money. Uh, um, um, oh, I've got the colours the wrong way around there. Sorry, apologies. Uh, I it was noted that there were some mistakes in here. Um, so yes, yeah, so obviously they're going to be selling electricity onto the market, and they will be getting that money back. From our point of view, the renewable certificates will be coming over to Devon County Council, and Devon County Council will carry on purchasing uh, electricity from Empower or Eon or whatever, um, uh, and and getting our energy that way. But we will have this separate arrangement where, as I say, we're, we're, we're getting regos, the renewable energy certificates, and we are exchanging cash. Now, the way the cash works in the synthetic PPA, so as I say, you've got this, um, uh, sorry, the system whereby I'm saying to a developer, we're going to agree a, a, a price, which is called a strike price. So we think that will probably be around £55 per megawatt. So Devon County Council says, yes, there you go. We will give you, um, uh, we'll say that if, if the price that you get, the generator gets from the wholesale market goes below 55 pounds per megawatt, we will top that up. So if it's 50 pounds, we will top up that five pounds per megawatt. If it's over the strike price, so if you're getting more than 55 pounds from the market, we will get that little bonus. So in that way, over the 17 years, and here you've got this sort of whole price, um, wholesale price there in, in the orange bars and our, our guaranteed price, which would have some kind of um, uh, inflationary uh, aspect to it as well. So over a 17 year period, um, you can you can be sometimes you'll be topping up and sometimes you'll be benefiting from from that. Uh, let me move on to the next slide. Um, so uh, this one here, just in relation to how we've, the only place really you can get forecast data on energy prices is from BASE, from the uh, UK government. And they've got some different scenarios, low, medium and high. And when we look at those, you know, based on analysis and consultation with, with DCC Finance, um, we've concluded the proposal would be likely to be cost neutral and possibly generate an average saving of £37,000 per year based on 2019 money. You know, the income increases to 4 million over 15 years if you're using the high scenario. 
but it becomes a cost of five million if you're losing the the low scenario. So there is some differences there, and all of these forecasts generally don't come right uh, exactly. Um, but we we really think that it's going to be a cost neutral way uh, of delivering renewables and also carbon savings. So benefits then, um, as I say, we through this we can definitely um, secure local. Oh, sorry, local community owned energy. Um, we don't need to procure. Um, but we do need to uh, be able to evidence uh, value for money, and I'll come back to that in, in a second. Um, it's a very cost-effective way of doing carbon offsetting, potentially cost-neutral. Um, uh, and also it could act as a partial hedge, because as, uh, I'm not a financier, but, it, um, but essentially as um, energy prices go, go up, obviously your energy bills are going to be uh, going up but also you're going to be generating income through the synthetic power purchase agreement because they're going to be going out to the wholesale market. The generator is going to get more than the strike price, so you're going to get that money back. But of course, well, not of course, sorry, we're only thinking of putting about 30% of our consumption through a synthetic PPA, so it is only a, a partial hedge. Um, so in terms of community energy then, so meat, a most economically advantageous tender. So we're not going to procure, but obviously we need, I need to be able to say to the councillors that this is going to be the right thing to do. So we got um, CAG consultants to do a social economic assessment of um, the synthetic PPA. And they determined that, um, that doing this through a community organisation and not through a commercial provider would generate an additional £15.27 million in economic value to Devon County Council. So I feel like we've, we've ticked that box there. Um, we will require the SPPA provider to deliver uh, community ownership and reinvest uh, um, reinvestment of profits into community carbon saving projects and asset based within the locality to deliver the added value. And we can get that through adding clauses into the synthetic power agreement with the Devon Energy Collective, you know, with stuff in the articles of association and so forth. So I think that we can be you know, confident that it's delivering added value and also we can get the long-term assurance that we, we need. Um, so um, in terms of car carbon offsetting, so there's three factors to carbon offsetting. One is uh, the source of the renewables, um, you know, where um, the energy is generated, purchased and supplied as a retail commodity to the consumer is definitively produced by renewable energy technologies. I think we can confirm that, we've got the agreement. Uh, the renewable energy attribute, so the energy volume retains its renewable energy guarantee. Yes, we're going to have that. And then renewable energy additionality. So the purchasing of the electricity by the user results in new renewable generation capacity being built. Well, I think that's always going to be tenuous, whatever um, uh, route you take. But I think it's pretty, we're pretty clear with our discussions with Devon Energy Collective that they need this to make these things happen. So I think we, we can argue that as well. Um, and so I think that we can claim the, the carbon offsetting from this, this scheme. So the next steps for us, um, unfortunately there is a bit more work to be done. Um, subsidy analysis, so we've got rid of state aid, but now we've got subsidy. We're fairly confident we can comply with subsidy regulations, but we need to do that and we're just waiting for a, a legal opinion on that one. Um, in terms of sign off, then it's got to have a it's a lovely journey through all of the levels within Devon County Council to see if we get member approval for it, well, officer approval, the member approver, uh, approval. We also, for the reference price, uh, so we need some kind of mechanism for setting and, uh, and reconciling against that strike price that we agree with the generator. Uh, this could be based on an index or each party's actual contract prices. Um, if the reference price, sorry, if the reference is to each party's actual contract prices, a mechanism for each party to ensure the other ensures the best possible value will be needed. So there's a little bit of complexity in there, but it, it needs to, that's easily and um, not easily. So I'm very confident that can be worked out. And then we need to also think about how the payments are made between Devon County Council and the Devon Energy Collective as well. And then the building of a partnership. You know, we're thinking of putting 30 megawatts through through the SPPL. Well, that's the, the idea. Really, Devon Energy Collective needs to get to a portfolio of 100 megawatts to be able to go out to the market and get things developed. So we need to um, get other people involved with it as well. And, we're, and we've got a number of uh, other authorities within Devon that, that are keen to, to look into this. 
so hopefully uh, within a few months we'll have something more to talk about i'm always uh, overly optimistic about how things it's how long it takes to get decisions made but we're getting there and obviously all of the stuff that we've done that will all be publicly available for other organizations to have a look at so thank you very much Wonderful. Thank you very much, Alistair. A lot of great food for thought there. Without any further ado, I will hand over to our last speaker of the day, and I'm very pleased to welcome Joseph Holmes, Executive Director for Resources and CFO at West Berkshire Council. Joseph holds responsibility for services including finance, IT, legal, procurement and HR. He has held other senior roles in local government, including as CFO at Winchester City Council and Slough Borough Council. He has served on various SIPPA panels and is currently a member of SIPPA LASAC. We'll be coming to your questions very shortly, so please do keep sending them through. And I will now endeavour to hand over to Joseph. OK, uh, thank you very much. I will try and move this along, which which I can't. So if you can have another go, actually, at trying to, trying to let me uh, have control of this, that would be lovely. Yep, one second. OK, Joseph, let's try that again now. Super, lovely. Okay, so uh, I, I suspect I've got a bit less time than I thought, so I'll try and race through this. Uh, so yeah, uh, my name's uh, Joseph Holmes, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, here's a picture of uh, Green Common, which uh, is on uh, within West Berkshire, uh, and just to the left-hand uh, side of things, there's some nice solar panels on top of a building there, so I'll come on to that in just a second. Uh, so we're a unitary authority right there in the middle of the south uh, of England, uh, as we, as our name says on the tin, we are in uh, the west of Berkshire, so quite a rural uh, area uh, with a range of market towns. Um, so we launched a community municipal investment or bond that I'll refer to uh, in a minute and this is uh, and we did this all around uh, us declaring climate emergency a couple of years ago as we mentioned before um, and the reason we, we looked at a, a bond uh, was because like many of uh, the rest of uh, the sector we use the PWLB um, but um, yeah, as we know, it's been put up twice in the last uh, decade arbitrarily by the government. Uh, so we're looking at what other arrangements are there for financing our capital programme outside of the PWLB. That's not to say we won't use PWLB in the future, I'm sure we will. Uh, but we just wanted to see what alternate uh, arrangements might be in place, which would uh, link to our community a little bit more than just picking up the phone to central government. So I mentioned the PWLB, uh, uh, just a graph here that many of us on the finance side of things will be aware of. So back in the autumn of 2019, PWLB rates only jumped up by 100 basis points and then they dropped down again. Uh, back at the end of 2020, but just shows some of that volatility that we have when we're looking at capital schemes in the future and also uh, when you're trying to uh, plan individual schemes as well. Uh, I'm quite a big fan of trying to get as much certainty as we possibly can into our medium term financial strategy. So, so we had a, a good look at this. Um, so rates have increased. Uh, I'm very keen on, on that control, but also really interested in the concept of the bond, uh, which was to launch and to try and have a much greater level of engagement and conversation with our residents. Uh, uh, rather than just pick up the phone to central government. Uh, so, so how it works is we've got an underlying need of about £15 million, uh, but the scheme itself uh, works by uh, retail uh, investors investing in the council, uh, so they can be residents of West Berkshire or come on to where actually they, the, the investors did reside, which was across the whole of the UK. Uh, there was a minimum investment with us of, of five uh, pounds and we then paid a return of 1.2 percent or we will be paying a return of 1.2 percent on that investment over the next uh, five years we work with an organization called abundance to administer the scheme so the physical and uh, actual administration uh, was was nothing to do with us all that customer side of things was looked after uh, by a uh, by abundance and we were a pilot with a with a number of other councils looking uh, into this so we did get some external funding to do some of the legal and sort of accounting and auditing due diligence work beforehand uh, so what happened is, is uh, uh, I take a couple of reports to our executive to, to both get into the pilot and then say that we've done due diligence we're okay to launch so we launched in the middle of the uh, COVID pandemic last year uh, in July and we aim to get the million pounds from investors over a three-month date 
I was very unsure as to would we get there and and and, and over what sort of period we might get there but we managed to do it um uh, just under a couple of weeks early which which was great and we had a lot of interest uh, both locally and nationally so on the right uh is a picture of the finance portfolio holder at west Berkshire, uh, councillor ross mckinnon uh the the the, the, the times uh, ran an article uh, on uh, over the summer um so it only been a uh, uh local politicians for for sort of less than a year and he already managed to to get a picture of himself in the times so uh, I think he was. Uh, I think he was also very pleased. Uh, pleased with some of that, but we had a lot of interest from uh, from from our residents, uh, um, as as well as some of the more sort of local um, uh, publications, as well as what's happening uh, nationally. So, um, what was really important as well is that for, for me anyway, there's that million pounds uh, funded schemes that we already had in the capital program. So, I've, I've sort of listed them here, I'm not going to repeat them, you can read them. But that was a really crucial part of the bond. Interesting, when, I, when we launched it, some of the some of the local residents were really keen on us doing sort of new things. And were, you know, I saw one of the earlier speakers talking on that point around additionality. Uh, so, residents were like, right, we need to go big with sort of wind or solar. Um, but to me, it's very important that actually the bond uh, was based and uh, was going to fund schemes that were already in the capital programme so that we knew that we were going to deliver them uh, so that they could see that, that actually they are happening or they have taken place. Uh, and then we can communicate that back and then have that narrative with those investors to say, actually, this is what your money uh, has gone towards and this is what it has funded. So our solar PV project, uh, which took about half of the funding, um, very similar to to uh, some of the other speakers here before uh and, and not a not a huge amount uh but it's only a step in the right direction for us uh, and to have some sort of pictures there of of, sort of where we sort of stuck them uh, up at greenham uh, common there uh, and then some of the other sort of works that, that we did with uh, with the local wildlife trust what was really interesting though is that um we put our first returns back to the investors in april so as i said the, the scheme closed in october and uh, we've done this on the annuity basis, so it matches exactly our borrowing uh, over five years as it would be with the PWLB. Um, and, and, and as I said, we, we, we borrowed at 1.2%. The prevailing certainty rate at the time was over 1.7%. So uh, there was a half percent saving on prevailing uh, rates at the time. Um, but we have an option as part of when investors receive their in returns. Uh, for them to donate uh, money back. We didn't particularly push this, but we just said that this is an option if you want it. And in April, about one in six investors actually returned their money to us. Um, it wasn't a huge amount, you know, the people are getting 1.2% return here. So it's, it's not, a, not, a, not, a, not a huge return that you're going to sort of re retire on anytime soon. Uh, but, but it was something, and, and I was really interested in this, I think it's an interesting one for the future as well, is that from an additionality point of view, that did enable us to then go out and expand our wildflower verge project, which is which is really popular locally, um, and that actually means that how people have used their finance hasn't just been on something which you know is, is part of the sort of ESG investment, but actually by giving us by donating some of their investment back, uh, it actually means we've been able to progress other schemes further. And I think what's really interesting with, with the bond as a whole is that any of the schemes, any of the investors, if they don't live in West Berkshire, they're, they're more than welcome to uh, come down to West Berkshire and actually see what has happened. So you can actually see as an investor what has changed because of your investment. I think this additionality point of view point is, is a really important one. As the investors themselves, uh, so you can see uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, that just shows when we got the investment in. So we got an awful lot in in the first couple of months. Then it was a lot quieter over the summer, as I suppose people went on holiday perhaps for the first time. Uh, and then as soon as we announced that uh, this was about to close, it, 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 uh, it got to the full amount really quite quickly. What's interesting in the top left-hand corner is that if you're a local investor, you invested over twice as much as somebody who didn't live in West Berkshire. And you can see on the map in the bottom right-hand side, side of things that, that we did have investors from across the country, um, well, uh, 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 across the UK. And just in the bottom middle, that just shows the investment amount. So um, we had, uh, as a proportion, about 25% of investors invested less than uh, £100 uh, into this. Obviously, it's a much smaller amount of the total investment, but a real spread there as to how much people were investing. I talked about the donation option, so, so that's going to some extra wildflower seeds, which are busy flowering at the moment. Uh, 
Uh, and just some reflections from me. So uh, it'd be, I think it'd be, we, we focus ours very much on uh, a net zero, but you could have a look at different options as well. I, th I think there's definitely some applicability for housing, for example. I think it probably works better for shorter term borrowing. I don't know how interested people would be at some of the returns perhaps that we could offer for longer than 10 years. Um, it, it is a longer process in PWLB, but that uh, so now resident engagement and that narrative, I think, is 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 really important and a really useful uh, tool uh, for us. Um, I thought what was really also really helpful is that abundance did a lot of due diligence on us as well. So um, lots of uh, debates with us around, you know, would we ever issue a Section 114 report? What would that look like? What was our reserves position like? How borrowed are we compared to other authorities? So again, you don't really particularly get any of that when you borrow through PWLB or other forms of borrowing. Whereas actually, I, I quite enjoyed that challenge of the private sector sort of looking at us and saying, actually, you know, what does what does your financial resilience look like? Which in the current climate, I think, is really important. So uh, we we'll certainly look at look at uh, going down this route again. And I think I finished with uh, a few minutes to spare. So uh, uh, there we are. Actually, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Joseph. I'm conscious of the fact that we've only got a little bit of time left to run to questions. So if we could get all of our speakers onto the screen, that would be fantastic with their microphones on. And we have Alistair, we have Dara and we, ha we have Joseph. And I think we're just waiting on Cheryl. Great, we have everybody, wonderful. So running to our questions then. Uh, we have a question here. It is fine knowing your asset base, but from where can one obtain the initial finance? A lot of residents want a quick return, low payback period for their council tax, in particular where demographically, most of the local population, at least 70% are of retirement age. Who would like to come in on that one? Cheryl. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. I think the first thing there is to say, certainly at Cambridge County Council, all our investments are not part of the council tax um, um, formula. So this is done outside through public works loan borrowing or borrowing from other um, um, uh, facilities. So I think that's the first thing to note. Um, the second thing was that actually um, when you describe or think about um, the renewable energy in terms of climate risk and the cost that could potentially be coming or is experienced at the moment by our communities and especially the more vulnerable communities will experience it even higher is um, those costs need to be put in and calculated into some of the uh, business cases that we're developing just as an example when you're developing, um, let's say, a road project, you don't see the climate risk costs being put into that, yet there are significant challenges being ex uh, um, experienced in our community on flood risk from climate change. So um, my experience to date is that residents understand the, the value of uh, some of this investment. Mm. But if I could, like yeah, if I can just jump in as well, very briefly, um, I think the <clears throat> my experience is that this is an iterative process. So at the very beginning, you don't need to ask for very much money in order to get a, a an initial snapshot of, OK, this is what our assets look like, you know, and, and that's really kind of just working with your estates team to get started on looking at where everything is. And then, um, you know, there are some opportunities out there around working um, organizations like the Energy Savings Trust or, or you know, getting small grant amounts that will help you to get started, which really are not there to prove the business case. It's really there to demonstrate that actually you have an opportunity. So I would suggest that at the earliest stages, you're not trying really to, to take one project over the line. You're simply trying to understand the landscape within which you're operating. Great. Thank you, Dara. Uh, I am just finding the other question that we had that I wanted to put to you. Apologies, everybody. Our system is being a little bit slow at my end. Uh, okay. 
Here we go. So th I think this one would be a great one for the entire panel to come in on, uh, particularly uh, those of you who have presented case studies today. So how have you achieved getting buy-in on these projects from internal stakeholders, members, residents and investors? So Joseph, should we bring you in on that one first? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I think um, the the key thing for me is, and um, so when I took to some other councils about this as well, is, is that overall using the community ministry of investment route uh, saves all taxpayers uh, money. So irrespective of what your view is on 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 the environment, by being able to borrow at a lower rate, it means that um, uh, all taxpayers are benefiting from that. So therefore, it's very hard to then argue against it if you if you if if you want to uh, argue against it. So I think proving that I think was really important. I think lots of discussions we have are really really beneficial around getting to net zero, etc. But sometimes they can. Uh, go off on a tangent a little bit, whereas I think using uh, that sort of financial sort of basis, so we've saved, I don't know, it's only a million pounds, we've saved about 14, 15,000 pounds on borrowing costs we do, through doing this, that means then we can reinvest that something else, we use it as a saving or, 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 or whatever, it makes it really hard then to, to kind of argue against that, and at, at that point it made it quite a relatively easy sell uh, to certainly, certainly political stakeholders and then internal stakeholders as well to to sort of buy into the project and and uh, get it uh, over the line. Alistair, do you have any thoughts on that one? Getting buy-in? Yeah, well, we haven't got ours over the line, so I'd be cheeky to say if I've done, I've done it. Um, uh, I, I think um, so. We've engaged a lot of different departments. I suppose I've had to pull together a document and really just try and think for each of the different departments what are they going to want to see. You know, the main driver is we've got to achieve net zero um, and. This is this is a way to do it. So that policy gives us the in, um, but uh, and then looking at all the legals of it, so we don't have to procure. Hopefully, we'll get the subsidy compliance and everything like that. So trying to sort of uh, answer all of those arguments we might come forward. But the main one is going to be that there is potentially a revenue implication, and there is a level of risk around that, and it will all come down to senior mem uh, senior officers and members that their you know their their sort of risk appetite. I, um, and yeah, I don't know which way it will go really, but I think yes, yeah, so you've just got to try and answer all of the questions as, as as quick as you can really, and cover all the bases. Yeah. Sarah, do you have any uh, quick reflections on the buy-in question? Yeah, sure. Um, I obviously agree with what Joseph and, and Alistair have said. I think I would start with data. Uh, good data um, is just absolutely critical because um, it is so important that you, first of all, understand the risks of doing nothing. Uh, at West Sussex, we really you know, did a piece of work around trying to understand where our electricity prices were at the time, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and then and then identifying actually, you know, what was the, the value at risk of, of doing nothing. Um, I think the other element, uh, besides good data management as a starting point, is probably just to get some actually very small, very simple projects over the line. Give people a flavour for what it actually looks like and feels like to have some solar panels on a building. Picking off the, uh, the, the, the buildings that you know you're going to be occupying over the next 10, 15 years can be a challenge even now, but I think that's the, that's the starting point. When people start to see it and they start to see the saving that they're making, then they start to buy in a bit more and a bit more and a bit more and you can actually start progressing from there. Great, thank you, Dara. I'm conscious of the fact that we started a little bit late, so I'm going to squeeze in one last question. Um, any views from the panel on the need for a limited company to deliver energy sustainability projects, noting the initial comments about current powers to sell electricity? Mm. I, I think they could be useful. Um, you know, we've been trying to think about that. Uh, Plymouth City Council have been able to deliver quite a lot through the setting up of Plymouth Energy Community, which I think was a kick. Um, so has doesn't come with all of some of the, the baggage that a local authority come from. So I think, and obviously there are loads of county council, uh, sorry, loads of councils that have set up armed length operations uh, and managed to do quite a lot. Laser is, is one of those as well. So I think they are very useful um, as long as you get the governance right. So, sorry, but yeah. Yeah, I think, I think, I think from my point of view, I think, I think governance, you're absolutely right, is, that, is, a, is a crucial issue there. And I think, I think sometimes it can be really, really attractive to think, oh, I've set up this, this uh, company and it's all, it's all going to be absolutely fine just because I've set up this company. However, yeah, it's important to look at the legal side of things. Actually, what can we still do within the council before setting up something, which often, uh, though they're right, you think, oh, this can be more nimble because it's outside of the council. 
but then all of the governance that you have to put inside and especially in light of, of some of the re recent issues with other councils around companies there's a growing um i think spotlight being put on local authorities uh companies uh at the moment so you just got to balance that 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 potential for for greater freedom in the future with actually all the governance that you need to put in place internally uh in the first place and and, and, and sort of weigh up that balance any final reflections from Dara or Cheryl? Um, what I would say there is you do need to know why you want to set up a company. So if it was uh, that you're wanting to sell electricity, that's one thing. So when you look at the companies like Robinhood and uh, Bristol, um, or is it that you're looking at setting up a company for the freedoms of, let's say, procurement and um, managing some of the systems efficiently? Um, to date, we haven't set up a company, um, but uh, at some stage in the future, when we get to a scale, um, we may want to set up a company just for the efficient management of it. But I take the other points from Alistair and Joseph around governance and, um, you know, you need to understand what you're setting up. Great, thank you. So I think that's where we're going to have to wrap things up for today. So thank you very much to all of our speakers for joining us. This webinar will shortly be available on SIPFA's YouTube channel, so please do subscribe to watch it back or share with colleagues, as well as for access to all of our previous and future free webinars. I'm conscious of the fact we had quite a few questions that we weren't able to get to, so we will endeavour to put your questions to our speakers after the fact and come back to you if you have a question that we didn't get to. Uh, we hope you found today's discussion interesting and informative, and we hope you'll join us again for another webinar very, very soon. So goodbye for now. Yes, bye.